tornado. I have a death wish. I'm a 75 year old man and I have bone cancer. The doctors have given me three months to live. They say I have a chance to live longer if I do chemotherapy, but I'm not interested in the side effects. I already live in constant, crippling pain. If chemo doesn't work, it'll probably just add fatigue, nausea, and kidney issues to the equation. One of the few things I do still have is a full head of hair. I could likely kiss that goodbye as well. And what if it did work? What, I got a few more years of life before I catch some other disease? Or worse yet, just lose my mind and become a stranger to those who know me best? No thanks. My wife died last year. I have no life without her. And let's all face the facts. I'm on the final decline. There's no going back up the hill. The best I can hope for is that I die before I get too far down it. I would just let the bone cancer eat me away, but the pain is unbearable. I can't get through a day without hefty doses of painkillers. If I were a dog, my owners would show compassion and put me down knowing that I'll only get worse and suffer more. But I'm not a dog. Unfortunately, I'm human. And no one is allowed to put me down without risking life in prison if they happen to be caught providing me with such an act of kindness. In this day and age, a bunch of fat cat politicians get to decide whether or not to grant permission for terminally ill folks like myself to be put out of their misery. Permission. To me. A 75 year old grown man. Ridiculous. Those heartless bastards would rather me suffer every single day of my life and force my loved ones to watch me as I wither away in agony. I don't want my children to witness my brain turning to mush while I lie in a puddle of my own piss because I've lost control of all my faculties. I refuse. Two days from now is the one year anniversary of my wife's demise. Thankfully, she went suddenly in her sleep. No pain, no misery. I plan on holding out until then. On that day, I'll take matters into my own hands and put a gun in my mouth. I was sitting on my front porch in a rocking chair when the storm began. The newsman said there was a possibility of strong storms. That was an understatement. The winds picked up something fierce gusting in from the southwest, roaring through the trees and tossing around any debris that wasn't weighted down. And then the rain began. It was deafening, pounding on the street like a million tiny sledgehammers. I watched as my neighbor pulled haphazardly into his driveway, no doubt due to his vision being obstructed by the sheets of rain cascading down his windshield faster than his wipers could push it aside. As he exited his vehicle and raced to the shelter of his home, he yelled out in pain as blades of rain slapped down upon him like a thousand needles. The hail was enormous, like giant softballs. They crashed to the earth with sickening thuds like one might imagine a storm of watermelons to sound. A myriad of glass breaking overtook the sound of the storm as hail erupted through the windshields of the cars in the neighborhood that were not garaged. In the distance I could hear the ruckus approaching. It sounded like 50 men throwing metal trash cans against a building all at once. A blinding flash of lightning revealed the menace in the distance. A wedge-shaped funnel cloud. And then pure darkness until the next illumination of lightning. The tornado was closing in quickly. I could barely hear the scream of tornado sirens over the pounding of hail, flood of rain, and the cacophony of horror emerging from within the tornado. 
Across the street was a thin line of forest that separated my house from a restaurant and a gas station. Being that it was December, the leaves of the tree that normally shielded the view of the buildings had long since been shed, allowing me to watch the funnel cloud as it raged toward them. That's when I heard the roar. The roar didn't sound like that of a freight train or a jet engine. It sounded like a beast. Lightning flashed, allowing me to see the tornado just before it made impact with the restaurant. And then all went dark. But through the rain, hail, and blackness of the storm, I could see two red glowing objects racing toward the restaurant. Lightning flashed again, and I could see that the red glowing objects were shining like eyes from within the tornado. Lightning blazed through the sky just as the funnel cloud impacted the restaurant. The roof of the establishment was ripped off and flung into the distance like a frisbee. I watched on in terror, and I swore that I saw a long, thick, claw emerge from the tornado, grasp the restaurant, and fling it into the sky. I then witnessed a muscular black hairy arm reach out of the funnel cloud. The gigantic fist at the end of the arm pounded down on the gas station until it was flattened to the ground. And then the tornado made its way for me. I could hear thudding footsteps that shook the earth as it approached. The red eyes in the center of the twister were shining bright, and I realized that they were attached to a horrific, beastly head which emerged from the tempest. Its jaws were snapping open and closed like an evil tractor excavator as it chewed through the trees and emerged onto my street. I began to wonder if all tornadoes had monsters lurking inside of them. Or was this one unique? By now, all of my neighbors were huddled in their closets, bathtubs, or basements. I was alone to witness the monster within the tornado. I was afraid, but not of the monster. I was afraid it might change course and spare me. I couldn't let that happen. I used every ounce I had to shimmy up the electricity pole next to my house and climb onto my roof. The wind from the monstrous tornado was trying to hurl me, but I kept my balance and rushed to the edge of the roof and screamed out, I'm right here! If you want me, come and get me! I held out my arms wide as if hoping to embrace the tornado. The monster locked its nefarious glowing eyes on me, and the funnel cloud and rampage toward me and then came to a sudden standstill. Hail, rain, and debris from the twister were pelting me, but I didn't care. I was ready to meet my end. The monster in the tornado stuck its ugly head out of the safety of the funnel cloud and stared at me. It appeared confused by my defiance. Apparently, it was used to people running from it in fear. Confusion quickly turned to fury as the monster's brawny claw wrapped around me and lifted me high into the air, holding me eye-level with it. I could see the ire within the monster's enraged eyes. Its hairy face crinkled in anger, and its evil eyes grew brighter. It let forth with a thundering roar. It wanted me dead, and I wanted it to kill me. I could feel my disease-riddled bones beginning to crack as the monster started to squeeze the life from me. I was seconds away from death. My suffering was about to end. This made me happy, and I made a mistake. I smiled. My jovial smile infuriated the monster even more, and rather than finish the job by crushing me, it hurled me through the air like a rag doll. Two days later, on the anniversary of my wife's death, I woke up in the hospital. 
I was battered and bruised. I had multiple gashes all over my body, and my hip was shattered. Unfortunately, I was still alive. A beautiful nurse stood before me. She explained the extent of my injuries and informed me that they were going to take me into surgery for a hip replacement. No! No! She tried to calm me down and told me this was necessary or I would never walk again. She didn't understand, so I took her hand and pulled her close to me. I have bone cancer. I'll be dead in three months at the latest. I'm in enough pain as it is. Just let me die. I could see the empathy in her eyes as she listened to my words and understood what I was going through. She held my hand and seemed sincere when she asked me if there was anything she could do to help me. So I told her, If you really want to do something for me, put me out of my misery. The nurse patted my hand and showed me a compassionate smile before exiting the room. A few minutes later, she returned holding a syringe and quietly shut the door behind her. Finally, a merciful soul. She approached my bed and administered the injection. She was able to do what the monster within the tornado could not. End my suffering. The Disembodied Voice My folks bought a new house three months ago and all was going swimmingly. The house was a large Dutch colonial. It had an attic that I turned into my bedroom. It was nice because I had my own floor and the further away I could be from my annoying 13-year-old sister, the better. The new house wasn't too far from where we previously lived. I was just further out of town and more private. I was still in the same school district, so I didn't have to change schools, which would have been a bummer. And I recently turned 16 and got my driver's license, so I could drive myself to school and didn't have to deal with a new bus route. For no good reason, my girlfriend Tina was scared of the house. She didn't like to come over. She said every time she stepped into the house, she got an uneasy feeling. I thought the whole thing was kind of silly, but I got along with her family and didn't mind going to her house more often. My classmates all insisted that the house we bought was haunted, although none of them experienced anything for themselves. My best friend Roland swore that a boy once hung himself in the attic. He couldn't tell me who or when, but he heard about it somewhere and took it as gospel. It was all hearsay, and I didn't think there was any truth to the rumors because we had been living there for three months and nothing unusual had occurred. Yet. It was early on in our third month of living there when things started to happen. My dad was a foreman at a local factory. He came home late from work one night and was griping about his new supervisor. I was in the living room in the front of the house, but could hear him complaining to my mother in the kitchen. As my dad continued his rant, I heard what sounded like someone letting out a deep breath. It came from the other side of the living room. I would have thought it to be my bratty sister, but she was sitting next to me. I asked her if she heard that, and she said, I thought that was you. A week later, my mother was in a tizzy because she was about to leave for the grocery store but had misplaced her shopping list. 
She was carrying on and stomping around the house as she looked for it. I was on the second floor heading toward my room. When I opened up the door to my bedroom attic, I was met by a hot gust of air. Then I heard a muddled, raspy voice coming from the top of the attic stairs. I thought it was my sister fooling around. I dashed up the stairs already yelling at her to get out of my room, only to find no sign of anyone. Not long after that, I was lying in my bed and could hear my sister moaning about something down in her bedroom. I wasn't quite sure what her problem was. It sounded like it was some kind of issue with her wardrobe. As she squawked, I heard the voice again. It was very deep, and it strung together a few unintelligible words. There was no doubt that the voice came from somewhere in my room. I checked the closet under the bed. I even checked in the cedar chest I kept extra blankets in. There was nobody there. I told Tina and Roland about the strange happenings. This just reaffirmed Tina's stance as she said, See, I told you there was something off about that house. After hearing my story, Roland brought up an interesting point. He mentioned that every time the disembodied voice manifested, someone was complaining about something. He suggested that whatever the voice was, it fed off of negative energy. With that theory in mind, I kept extra focus on the emotions my family was emitting in the house, and if that seemed to trigger the voice, and oddly enough, there seemed to be some truth behind it. I never ever heard the voice when people were happy or even in satisfactory moods, but when someone was having a bad day, somewhere, I'd hear a deep whisper or voice. I could never make out what was being said, but I could hear it. It was there. There was one time when everyone seemed to be in a pleasant mood, and I heard subtle whispering coming from across the house. That was the only time I heard it when there didn't seem to be anything wrong. So in that instance, I questioned everyone in the house. I asked them all if everything was okay and if they had a good day. My mom confessed that she had some car trouble on the way home and was worried that it might be the transmission, which would be a major repair. So once again, even though it wasn't obvious, there was a negative energy within the house when the voice manifested. Even though it was spooky, I was kind of excited to tell Roland that I thought I had proven his theory correct. Roland was a bit of a science geek and often spent his free period messing around in the science labs. When I entered the lab to tell him the results of my little experiment, my heart dropped. It was Roland and Tina. They were kissing. I wasn't aware that I let out an audible gasp, but I obviously did because they broke off their kiss and turned to me in shock. I stared daggers at both of them and then stormed out of the lab in disgust. Tina came running after me. I didn't want anything to do with her, but she pleaded her case anyhow. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. I, I should have never done that. I stopped and snapped at her. At the very least, you should have broken up with me before you did it. Now get away from me, you filthy whore, before I catch a disease. She started crying and ran off. I was in the parking lot heading toward my car when Roland caught up with me apologizing profusely. Man, I'm so sorry. I'm a horrible friend. I, I should never have done that. I, I let my Johnson make that decision for me. It was a mistake. I punched him before he could say anything else. When I got home, I was steaming. I raced upstairs to my attic bedroom laid down in bed, and tried to calm myself by putting headphones on and listening to some music. But instead of music, I heard the disembodied voice echoing through my headphones, and I heard it with clarity. Kill. Them. Both. The temperature in my room got extremely hot and humid. 
I was dripping with sweat. Kill them both. Images began to flood in my mind of me taking my dad's shotgun to school the next day. I could perfectly envision Tina's head blowing apart as I pulled the trigger and smashing Roland's face to smithereens with the butt of the gun. Kill them both. It would be so easy. Kill them both. I ripped the headphones off my head and jumped from my bed. What the hell was I thinking? I started to run down the stairs, but felt like I was stepping through wet concrete. I was weighted down by the hate and by... the voice. Kill them both! It was feasting upon my negative energy. I felt like a serpent was inside my skull, wrapping itself around my brain, warping my mind into a mass of evil matter. If you won't kill them, kill yourself. I gritted my teeth, clenched my fists, and shouted, No! No! I, I won't do it! I, I won't do it! All at once the heat and humidity vanished from the air. My legs suddenly felt weightless and I raced down the stairs. As I bolted from the house and collapsed in the front yard, I could feel the evil serpent unravel from my brain and the malevolence was evicted from my mind. I never stepped foot in that house again. Alien Signal I work for a private company known as Cybrantech. We monitor electromagnetic waves in outer space in hopes of finding proof of alien civilizations on another world. The proof we are hoping to find would come in the form of a radio transmission from another planet. While we run into interesting signals often, they are usually one-offs meaning they do not repeat. It is believed that a true alien transmission would be repetitive. For example, if an alien world used the same technology and aimed their search at Earth, they would find a planet abuzz with electromagnetic activity. Three months ago we found such a signal from a planet that orbits a sun that is approximately 97 light years from Earth. We quickly figured out that this wasn't simply a transmission confined to the planet. It was an outbound message that we determined to be directed at our planet. The transmission was clearly that of an incredibly advanced civilization, and we found deciphering the message to be amazingly difficult, if not impossible. For the past two months, I had been working day and night on a software that could hopefully crack the code and give us an idea of what exactly was being communicated through the alien transmission. The software has been far more successful than I ever expected it to be. It was quick to conclude that the transmission was not in fact aimed at our planet, as we initially suspected. Instead, the transmission was directed at something just behind the moon. After concluding where the transmission was going, the software began breaking down the message within the transmission. It was an incredibly slow process, akin to reading a sentence by obtaining half a letter each day. Fortunately, as time went by, the sequence of decoding the message accelerated. It turns out that the message is relatively short, and although indescribably complex, the elaborate software had assured me that it could, in fact, decipher the message. At first, I thought the software was experiencing a glitch, because it would move along smoothly for long periods, and then tend to lag as if buffering. Later, I found out that was simply due to a continuance within the message. As it turns out, the transmission consisted of a very short message followed by a strange repeating pattern. It was the repeating pattern that the software was having so much trouble with, but still, 
it was making subtle progress every day. Today, the software went crazy. It started flashing and an alarm began to go off. I had designed it to do so when it successfully deciphered the message. I couldn't believe it. I never truly believed it could crack the code of the alien message. I was really just hoping for further confirmation that this was indeed alien technology and to perhaps get a slight understanding of what the transmission consisted of. A pure, successful deciphering of the transmission was not quite what I expected, but I was dancing with excitement when I realized that I was about to be the first person on Earth to ever read a message from another planet. It turns out the message was being delivered to some kind of craft that was hiding in the shadow of the moon. The message read, Prepare to destroy the planet. The portion of the message that the software had such a difficult time translating was the repetitive code being sent after the message. A countdown. A countdown to the destruction of our planet. I looked closely to see how much time Earth had before it ceased to exist, and my blood ran cold. Three, two, one.